allow me to introduce Catherine Besterman, who teaches anthropology at Colby College. She, her research focuses on mobility, militarism, sovereignty and citizenship, and racism, topics she has studied in South Africa, Somalia, and the United States. Uh, her books include Making Refuge, Somali Bantu Refugees, uh, and Lewiston, Maine, which was published in 2016, uh, Transforming Cape Town, 2008, and Raveling Somalia, 1999, and the edited volumes, The Insecure American, uh, Why America's Top Pundits Are Wrong, and Violence, A Reader. Um, a 2012 Guggenheim Fellow, her work has also been supported by the Rockefeller Foundation, the American Council of Learned Societies, the Wenner Grant Foundation, the American Philosophical Society, Sigma, uh, how do you, how do you, Zai, <laughs> and the School of Advanced Research. So please help me welcome Catherine Bresterman to the podium. Uh, thank you, Anwar. I'm so, so, so delighted to be here and to see um, so many friends and, and so many people who I hope will become friends. Um, I have to begin with an apology. Um, I have switched the title of my talk. Uh, I don't mean this to be a bait and switch. It's more like a bait and grow. And so uh, the talk that I'm going to give you tonight still um, will end up about immigration in Maine. But we're going to begin um, really large scale. I'm calling the talk, Are We Entering a New Age of Global Apartheid? And what I'm going to do is uh, begin by talking about the global, making, a, making an argument. Uh, the president of UNA has promised me it's OK to be provocative, so I'm going to be provocative. Um, but that doesn't mean I'm wrong. I think I'm going to be provocative and right. Uh, and the argument that I'm going to make is about what I, what I see as an emergent new world order about the governance of mobility. So we're going to start really big. We're going we're gonna, to um, then focus in on Somalia and on the issue of what has uh, provoked so many people to have to flee Somalia. We're going to go back out big again, um, continue with my argument about the sort of global regime of mobility, and then we'll end up in Maine by contextualizing Maine within this broader structure um, of uh, how, how mobility is orchestrated throughout the world. And I do intend to leave lots of time for question and discussion. OK. 20 years ago, Kenya announced, or two years ago, I'm sorry, Kenya announced its intention to close Dadaab, which is one of the world's largest refugee camps, as well as Kakama, another camp. Together, these camps house about half a million people, mostly Somalis, some of whom have relatives here in Maine. Because many people in the camps have no homes to which they can return in Somalia, Somalis throughout the diaspora began scrambling to try to figure out where their, camp, where their relatives, um, some of whom have been living in these camps for 30 years, might be able to go. As Anwar said, for the past decade and a half, I've worked with Somali immigrants here in Maine who were resettled into the US from Dadaab and Kakama. Tracking their efforts to find safety over the past two and a half decades since the onset of war in Somalia in 1991, has made visible for me a structure of something that here I'm going to call global apartheid, backed by militaristic force through which people from the global south try to navigate the barriers and violences imposed on them by governments based in the global north. Building from the experiences of Somali refugees that I know here in Maine, what I'd like to do, as I said, is present you this sort of very broad brush view of a world order in which race and mobility features the primary variables for which heightened security and militarization are being offered as the answer. So I'm going to sketch out some dimensions of this new world order, which I'm calling a militarized form of global apartheid. And then I'll conclude by situating Maine in this context, by talking specifically about how Maine is involved in this system. So first, let's do some definitions. Militarized global apartheid, as I'm defining it, is a loosely integrated effort by countries across the global north to protect themselves against mobility by people from the global south. The new apartheid takes the form of militarized borders. It's happening even as we speak. Interdictions at sea, detention centers, holding facilities, and the criminalization of mobility. It extends deeply into places from which people are attempting to leave, and it pushes them back. It tracks them to interrupt their mobility. It stops them at certain borders for detention and deportation. It pushes them into the most dangerous traveling routes. 
and it creates new forms of criminality. It stretches across most of the globe. It depends on an immense investment of capital, and it feeds a new global security industrial complex. Because the new apartheid relies on and nurtures xenophobic and nativistic rhetoric and ideologies, it recasts the terms of sovereignty, citizenship, community, belonging, justice, refuge, and civil rights, and it requires the few who benefit to knowingly and collectively demonize and ostracize the many who are harmed. A few more definitions. Um, by the global north, I mean the US, Canada, Europe, Israel, Australia, New Zealand, Russia, the Gulf states, and most of East Asia. These countries lead the way in militarization and border policing, as well as in managing a particular structure of temporary labor mobility across their borders through guest worker programs. I'm arguing that the policies of these countries in the global north contribute to insecurity and violence in the global south. The Caribbean and Latin America, Africa, much of the Middle East, um, <coughs> excuse me, and Central, Southwest, and Southeast Asia, against whose people the global north is in placing barriers. So Somalia offers a brief illustration of what I'm talking about. When Somalia's former dictator, Siad Barre, switched sides in the Cold War in 1977, he was allied with the USSR. In 1977, he switched um, to uh, an alliance with the United States, who was, who was uh, happy to embrace him. The US government and its allies poured economic and military support into the country, amounting to about a billion dollars over the subsequent decade. Somalia then became the second largest recipient of US economic and military aid in Africa, and it built the largest army in Africa during that decade. In 1990, following the fall of the Berlin Wall, the US Congress finally acknowledged that uh, Siad Bari had, a, had a, a blatant record of human rights abuses. While we were aiding him, he was bombing um, insurgents across the north of Somalia and voted to withhold further funding from his government. The vote was in um, December of 1990, and in January of 1991, um, without any more aid, his government collapsed. Uh, at that point, the militia groups that had been contesting his rule and fighting to bring him down began, turned against each other and began fighting against each other to determine who could take control of the state. The number of people displaced in this catastrophe during 1991 to 1993 tells a grave story of the after effects of US support for a brutal dictator. Nearly a million people fled Somalia. About two million were internally displaced and at least a quarter million, and probably many more than that, were killed. US intervention in Somalia has taken various forms over the subsequent two and a half decades, from the early boots on the ground intervention in the early 1990s, to funding for local warlords later on, including some of the very same warlords we had invaded to fight against initially. Uh, until the rise of a political entity called the Islamic Courts Union, or the ICU, in 2005, which finally brought a measure of peace to the country. But the Islamist rhetoric of the ICU alarmed Somalia's neighbors, as well as the United States, and Ethiopia invaded in 2006 with US military and intelligence support. The invasion overthrew the ICU, whose military wing then fled into the rural areas and regrouped to become the terrorist group now known as Al-Shabaab. The instability created by the invasion, the overthrow of the new government, and Al-Shabaab's violence contributed to a famine, a massive famine, which produced another massive flow of refugees and internally dis displaced people between 2006 and 2012. By the beginning of 2012, Somalia was more insecure than ever before. Al-Shabaab responded to its designation as a terrorist group by the United States with a pledge to target Western operations within and outside of Somalia and by allying itself with Al-Qaeda. In short, although US support, US foreign policy towards Somalia after 9-11 was ostensibly oriented toward quashing terrorism, many political an analysts argue that in fact it enabled Al-Shabaab to emerge as an effective anti-Western terrorist group. The vast majority of Somalis 
were left to manage in a devastated environment characterized by violence, famine, and insecurity. Everyone who was accepted into the US Refugee Resettlement Program had to leave behind in the refugee camps and in Somalia precious family members who were rejected for resettlement. Every Somali I know in Maine now sends remittances and worries constantly about their relatives still living in insecure refugee camps and in the dangerous regions of Somalia. For the past three years, the US has been bombarding Somalia with airstrikes, drone strikes, to kill suspected members of al-Shabaab. We've now killed hundreds upon hundreds, um, although uh, these drone strikes undoubtedly also cause civilian casualties and additional displacements as well. Somalis regular, regularly flee from the violence uh, into Kenya, where they're incarcerated in refugee camps. Some make their way north to get on leaky boats to cross the Mediterranean. The route to refuge in the US, of course, has been now cut off by the imposition of Trump's so-called Muslim ban and the um, cancellation of the family reunification program. The US has been joined in all of this by European governments and some of the Gulf states as well. So in short, these governments in the global north, in the name of their own security, have regularly intervened in Somalia and to contain Somalis, either through attempts to impose new governmental structures within Somalia that are more to their liking, or to impose new security regimes through proxy armies. When Ethiopia invaded, it was with US support. Kenya also invaded with US backing and support. Through alliances with warlords, as I said, we, we after fighting certain warlords within about six or eight years, then we were allying with those very same warlords through drone attacks and through militarized border controls, in effect, incarcerating Somalis in zones of profound insecurity. Somalia is only one example of the effect of policies in the global north that incarcerate and traumatize people in the global south. The emergence of a system of militarized apartheid used by wealthy and powerful countries in the global north against people from the global south is, I'm arguing, the signature form of globalized structural violence of our era. OK, let's move from Somalia now back out to the, to the larger picture. I'm first going to review the basic dimensions of how apartheid was implemented and regulated in South Africa, which is where it originated. And then I'll turn to a consideration of how the contemporary iteration of a racialized world order and a system of temporary guest worker programs replicates apartheid structures. So to apartheid per first. <clears throat> from 1948 to 1990, South Africa created an extensive and extreme apartheid system. Apartheid is a legal edifice that constructs and enforces the supremacy of one racial group over another. In South Africa, the apartheid system, supported by the National Party after its political victory in 1948, systematized white supremacy through policies and laws designed to manage the supposed threat posed by black people by incarcerating them in special areas where they were obligated to live while enabling their controlled and policed exploitation as workers upon whose labor South Africa was dependent. As it unfolded in South Africa, apartheid contained five key elements. First, it relied on an essentialized cultural logic that tied people to place through racial and nativist ideologies. All black people in South Africa were removed from white space, denied citizenship in South Africa, and sent to live in specific designated areas that were set aside only for black people. They were called independent homelands, and black people were told that they naturally belonged to these independent homelands, which was the justification for removing them from areas that were designated as sort of naturally available to white people. Second, Racial groups and the homelands for black people were made unequal because the homelands were impoverished by design. They were unsustainable for human life by, uh, intentionally. Third, the state created a bureaucratic system of identity documentation and mobility controls called pass laws that governed how black people were allowed to cross borders and enter space designated for white citizens, which basically was only for the purpose of working for them. So fourth, Apartheid was also about the control and exploitation of black labor. The past laws let black people into white space for the purpose of working, but they lacked political rights in that white space. Otherwise, they had no without a pass um, identifying them as workers, they had no legal right to be in white space. Fifth, because apartheid is exploitive and unjust, its maintenance requires a massive 
and expensive militarized security apparatus. These are the five elements, I'm arguing, that are now taking shape systematically on a global scale through a constellation of policies and laws. So I'm gonna briefly discuss each in turn before then we turn to Maine. Are we all good? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the nativism argument, identity belonging and nativism. So one of the characteristics of nationalism is the effort to tie people to place, thus enabling the illusion that cultural identity roots people in particular geographical places where they are imagined naturally to belong. So Mexicans belong in Mexico, Japanese belong in Japan, Somalis belong in Somalia, etc. Tying people to place through linking cultural identity and nation state membership or citizenship is the basis for the idea of immigration control. It makes mobility seem threatening to the consolidation of a nationalist identity. Nationalism is not natural, in part because mobility has been ubiquitous throughout human history. Humans are built to move, humans move. That is what it means to be human. Nationalism has to be created. Over the past century, states in the global north have been crafting nationalist ideologies for citizens while building mechanisms to police cross-border movements of non-citizens. So how do you consolidate nationalist identities? Elites often promote particular ideologies and cultural understandings about who belongs, usually by virtue of descent and birth. And governments, of course, have created passports, a relatively recent invention, to clearly brand those who belong and identify those who don't. In the white settler colonial states of the US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, in the colonizing states of Europe, and in the new nation of Israel, the process of consolidating a nationalist identity connected to citizenship has been a lethally racialized project. In the US, for example, the very first legislation, many of you I'm sure know this, to define the qualifications for citizenship, which was the Naturalization Act of 1790, restricted citizenship only to free whites whose mobility into the US remained unfettered. This is a law that remained on the books until 1952. This policy obviously required the government to create rules to define who could qualify as white, and then to use such racial criteria to determine political enfranchisement. Thus, the importance of whiteness as central to citizenship in the United States has gone on to take many different forms over the years, including anti-black racial segregation laws, influx control policies that prioritized certain immigrants and barred others, um, Jews were, were one of the victims of those, of those particular laws, the national origin laws, laws that barred Asians across the board from citizenship until the middle of the 20th century, and more. So the right to citizenship took shape in the US, as well as in Canada, Australia, and Israel, through a logic of belonging defined by settler colonialism. Other parts of the world have used different criteria. Heritage is a strong criteria in East Asian countries and the Gulf states. Um, but everywhere, states have historically relied on racial criteria to determine citizenship. Policing the mobility of those who don't belong has become a primary preoccupation of governments across the global north, with particular attention given to those who are seen as racially foreign. Okay, turning to the second element, impoverishment. The second element of apartheid then is in interventions by the apartheid state into areas designated for the racialized underclass in ways that render ordinary life unsustainable. In South Africa, as I said, the homelands created for black people were kept poor and, and politically powerless, although the South African government retained the ability to intervene in homelands, in the homelands at will. We can identify how this basic model now operates internationally through things like military interventions by the global north into countries in the global south. Examples abound, but the most recent ones certainly have been Iraq and Afghanistan, US invasion of both places. Um, we can think about uh, the US involvement or involvement of, of governments in the global north in various coups and assassinations. Um, throughout, uh, throughout Central and South America, including um, the US intervention in the coup that overthrew the Honduran government in 2009. Um, through things like austerity regimes imposed by multilateral institutions like the IMF on countries across the global south as a way of intervening in, in the management of debt. 
uh, in the form of corporate capitalist interventions. Again, the United Fruit Company in Guatemala and Central America is a paramount example of this, but abundant examples um, are available from throughout the world, various oil and gas companies in, in West Africa, mining concerns in, um, in South and Central America, logging corporations uh, working in Southeast Asia, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, through trade agreements that benefit the global north and harm the global south, and through large-scale land acquisitions in the global south by entities in the global north for the production of things like biofuels, timber, food crops, et cetera. Saudi Arabia is investing, for example, in gaining control of vast areas of land in places like the Sudan um, and uh, Ethiopia. So what's supposed to happen to people who have been displaced by these kinds of interventions? They can go to displaced persons camps. They can sicken and die. Or they can try to move across borders. Those who try to move across borders of the global north, and now we're talking about the third element of apartheid, are only allowed to do so if they have proper documentation and if they conform to legal requirements about border crossing. Recently, the global north has been on a criminalization binge against immigrants, and the incarceration rates of undocumented immigrants mirror the management of pass law violations in apartheid South Africa that filled jails with black people. In the global north of today, countries engage in mass incarceration to punish and remove undocumented racialized foreigners. One note in this system is the international refugee regime. I'm gonna talk about that, this for just a moment. Um, gaining official refugee status by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, or UNHCR, is made contingent upon a strict reading of political persecution that gives people the right to have crossed an international border to make a claim of persecution, but then strips them of all meaningful political and civil rights in countries where they don't belong while their claims are reviewed by authorities. It's legal to cross borders to ask for asylum, but once you have done so, you don't actually have a legal right to remain. Countries are not legally obligated to have to allow you to stay. So there's a, there's a contradiction or a, there's a, 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 a contradiction in the law there. The formal process of refugee identity documentation and management relies on refugee camps as holding facilities to restrict the mobility of refugees until other countries figure out where those people should be allowed to go. Officially recognized refugees who live in UNHCR camps are denied the right of mobility, they're denied the right to work outside the camps, they're denied rights of self-determination and political participation um, within the refugee camps and decision-making about the camp. The international system of such camps is designed specifically to protect state sovereignty, and specifically the sovereignty of wealthier countries in the global north from the movement of people in the global south, where the majority of refugees originate and where the majority of refugee camps are located. <laughs> So the international management of refugees enacts a fundamental inequality that grants power to the global north over people in the global south who are fleeing sometimes interventions from entities in the global north, from persecution, from war, from disaster. Meanwhile, people who carry passports from the global north can usually go wherever they want. It's really interesting if you look at um, who requires visas in order to travel. A constellation of countries across the global north um, do not require visas from each other's countries. Um, and everybody requires visas from countries across the global south. The EU has categories, uh, the countries that, um, that are not required to have visas for entry are, they used to be called the white countries, and the countries from which you had to have visas used to be called the black countries. They've changed that language, and now they call it negative positive countries and negative countries. But like, how transparent, you know. Um, furthermore, countries in the global north are eager to keep refugees far away from their borders because persecuted people who make it across the border of the EU or the US have a, a legal right to apply for asylum. So the overarching as aspiration of Frontex, which is the EU agency responsible for border control, is to ensure that potential asylum seekers never make it to the border of EU countries, that they're kept far away from actually crossing that border in the first place because of the legal obligation to consider the asylum applications of those who do manage to cross the border. 
EU countries, um, as a result, are now funding Libya. They're actually not funding Libya. They're funding militias in Libya, as well as Niger, Turkey, Morocco, Senegal, Sudan, and the Ukraine to interrupt migrants who are trying to make their way north and pull them into migrant holding facilities um, until somebody decides where those people should be allowed to go. So they can't even make it to the border of the EU, where they would be allowed to apply for asylum. The same desire governs asylum policy in the US and in Australia. The US is funding Mexico to try to stop Central Americans before they get to our border. And Australia def deflects migrants to islands offshore in other people's countries who are then funded to hold those migrants there um, on offshore islands. This kind of policing where these countries in the global north are funding countries in the global south to interrupt migrants and herd them into holding facilities and, and incarcerate them there. Um, this sort of policing operates outside of American, European, and Australian regulatory control. It's not subject to, to any oversight or transparency. And it offers countries on whose behalf migrants are being detained deniability about human rights abuses that may be taking place. Um, Libya is at the forefront of this. The migrants um, who get stuck or contained in Libya, um, the documentation about their, their uh, living experiences there is, is horrific. In addition, the official border management policies of the EU and the US intentionally push migrants into the most deadly sea routes and the most deadly desert crossings. So in the Mediterranean, Frontex um, has been deflecting migrant boats into the most dangerous sea crossings, the logic being if it's more dangerous, people will be unlikely to try to make the crossing. The reality is 13,000 people have died in the Mediterranean since 2014. Um, being pushed into the most deadly crossings. In the United States, it's the prevention through deterrence strategy that pushes migrants into the deadliest parts of the Sonoran Desert, and that has left countless thousands of people um, dead in the Sonoran Desert. These policies show the centrality of racism and the lengths to which countries in the global north will go to restrict the entry of brown people from the global south because they lack entry documents. In addition to blocking entry through finding ways to interrupt people's mobility and sticking them in camps, countries in the global north are also making vast use of detention centers and holding facilities within their borders. In the US, the 1986 and 1996 Immigration Reform Acts expanded the criteria for detaining and deporting immigrants, allowing the number of detainees to balloon to over 400,000 per year since 2012. <coughs> These de detainees are held across a shadowy and secretive network of public and private facilities with a budget for their detention in 2016 of over $2 billion just to incarcerate people. Over 30,000 immigrants, the vast majority from Mexico and Central America, are imprisoned in detention centers in the US on every, every single day. This is a quota set by Congress and fulfilled by ICE, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, Consequently, the business of detention has become hugely profitable, and it is a business. Most of the detention centers are run by private contractors. Um, the two major private contractors have posted net profits of hundreds of millions of dollars a year. And yet, while engineering the most highly elaborated border controls ever, the Global North still remains dependent on the labor of border crossers for everything from agriculture to domestic service, restaurant and hotel work, lawn care, elder and child care, amusement parks, food processing, logging, heavy construction, sex work, and more. Now we're in the fourth element of apartheid. Because the demand for cheap labor confronts the fortress mentality, many countries in the global north have created complex guest worker programs through policies that allow the entry of temporary migrants to perform certain jobs while denying them basic rights of self-determination and democratic participation, just like South Africa's past law system. In fact, guest worker programs in the global north are modeled on South Africa's past system that regulated black labor for the benefit of white employers. Temporary migrants are allowed to cross borders into countries in the global north through a dizzying array of work visas that apply to different sectors of the economy and carry different rights and protections. Nevertheless, work visas, which are intended to ensure control over imported workers, share a similar set of characteristics across the global north. Most, not all, but most are temporary, forbid migrant workers from bringing their families, are controlled by employers 
and not workers, and are often managed by labor brokers who can charge high fees to prospective workers, making them indebted even before their arrival. These laws are designed to create a flexible, replaceable, disempowered, and if need be, disposable workforce that cannot make demands on the host country and will not challenge the cultural integrity of the host culture. The most advanced example of this, of course, is in the Gulf countries, where in some of the Gulf countries, 90% of the population are migrant workers where they're on guest, um, guest worker visas with no, no right to citizenship, no right to democratic participation, um, and no right to a pathway to citizenship at all. In many countries across the global north, the controlled and contained workforce of authorized guest workers is, of course, augmented by a much larger workforce of undocumented people who endure exploitation, racism, insecurity, and the constant persistent threat of deportation in order to perform jobs that citizens don't want to do. Books about the experiences of those in the global north who hold guest worker and, and undocumented status describe the racialized hierarchies of belonging, rights, and human value that they create and reinforce. The resonance with South Africa's apartheid era past laws is evident. What these accounts describe is a system of labor control that depends on importing people from regions that have been made unsustainable for human life and ensuring their exploitability in the global north by criminalizing the presence of those who lack documents or by making their presence in their place of employment dependent upon their employer who holds their labor contract. Are we having fun? <laughs> <laughs> We're at the fifth element. The militarized security apparatus that maintains the apartheid structure that I've been describing is, of course, the fifth element. In the past two decades, the EU and the US, as well as Israel, have transformed border security into a spectacular militarized operation that absorbs ever-growing resources. The US border, most especially in the South, has now, before our very eyes, uh, become a militarized zone with the transfer of military technology and military strategy and now military personnel. And with the creation of um, what analysts call the constitution-free zone, which stretches inland 100 miles from the border within which civil rights can be suspended in the interests of security and immigration enforcement. The number of people carried out to do this work is staggering. The US Customs and Border Protection Division is the single largest federal law enforcement agency in the US with 60,000 employees and a 2017 budget of almost $14 billion. Immigration and Customs Enforcement employs another 20,000 with a 2017 budget of $3.2 billion. Importantly, despite the militarization of the US border, the vast majority of immigrants who attempt to cross without documents are actually successful, leading some to suggest that the militarized performance of border security is intended to appease white racism and discipline brown migrants, while also ensuring a steady supply of exploitable labor. So maybe the militarized border is like a spectacular a spectacularly costly form of hazing that stops some and kills some, while forcing those who do successfully get across to endure a painful, humiliating journey that demonstrates with utter clarity that the global north sees them as replaceable, exploitable, and forgettable. So turning to Maine, where is Maine in all this? Maine, of course, has been diversifying as immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers have made their way here. About 60 different languages are spoken in Portland's public schools. Perhaps a quarter of the student body in Lewiston's public schools are now from immigrant families. So how have these changes played out in Maine in relation to the argument that I've just been making about militarized global apartheid? A decade after Somalis uh, began moving to Maine in 2001, two Somali colleagues, Rilwan Osman and Ismail Ahmed and I, did an analysis of the prominent xenophobic rhetoric that was beginning to emerge. We conducted lots of interviews, we scrutinized media reports, we read tons of online commentaries, don't ever do that, but <laughs> you learn a lot. Um, and we came up with a list of the top 10 myths that were being sort of promulgated, um, xenophobic myths that were being promulgated about Somali immigrants in Maine. Um, these are myths that are familiar to all of you, I'm sure. The myths are Somalis are draining the welfare coffers, Somalis don't want to work, Somalis don't want to learn English, 
Somalis don't want to become citizens. Somalis get free apartments. Somalis get free cars. Somalis keep live chickens in their kitchen cupboards. I was like, really, we have to include that? And Rovan was like, yeah, I hear it all the time. Everybody wants to hear about our chickens in our kitchen cupboards. Somalis are responsible for rising crime. Somalis don't want to integrate. And Somalis got a free ride to America. So we did a lot of research to determine the facts, and we learned that Somalis used public assistance proportionally to a far less extent than non-Somalis, that the vast majority were employed, that their demand for English classes and citizenship classes far outstripped the supply, that no one gave them free cars, that no one kept live chickens in their kitchen cupboards, that their involvement in the criminal justice system was disproportionately small, that they were building robust community organizations for civic engagement, and that they were repaying the cost of their flights to the US. Refugees, when they get accepted to the US, actually have to pay for their flights here. Nobody gives them a free ride for anything. So the myths are all false. But what they reveal is a discourse about who has the right to claim to belong to American society through laying claim to things like public benefits and the right to civic engagement and that Somalis are defined in these myths as foreigners who shouldn't have these rights. We've heard these discourses echoed time and time again by our elected leaders. When President Trump stood on the tarmac at the Portland jet port and said that Somalis are the single greatest threat to Maine, when Governor LePage said that asylum seekers are the biggest problem in Maine because they bring diseases, including the Ziki fly. <laughs> When Governor LePage removed Maine from the Federal Refugee Resettlement Program, saying we don't want refugees here. When elected representatives introduced bills to further criminalize migrants and those who help them, such as penalizing sanctuary cities, so-called sanctuary cities. And so forth, justified by things like Larry Lockman's claim that Portland is, these are, this is his words, Portland is a magnet for illegal immigrants who have robbed, raped, and murdered Maine citizens. These officials are clearly distinguishing between those who are seen as having a right to be here and those who don't. And they are weaving a criminalizing rhetoric around those who they claim do not have the right to be here. Because so much of this rhetoric targets black and Muslim immigrants, the racial bias in, anti, in such anti-immigrant sentiment is undeniable. These are xenophobic ideologies that underscore apartheid. Maine's immigrants are not confined to Portland and Lewiston, of course. Rural Maine receives thousands of temporary seasonal mi migrant farm workers every year, migrant workers every year, mostly from Latin America and the Caribbean, who work in Maine's hotels and restaurants, on vegetable farms, raking blueberries, in seafood processing, making reefs, which is about to happen, and in the North Woods. These workers are here on temporary work visas or are undocumented. They remain largely invisible to other Mainers, and they perform work that sustains Maine's economy. Maine's agricultural, seafood processing, wreath making, logging, and hotel sectors would be totally compromised without them. Some have been coming to Maine for decades to work specific seasons like in the apple orchards or the blueberry barrens. Because they work in remote locations on visas that are usually controlled by their employers, and because their movements are so often uh, managed by labor brokers, they can be vulnerable to exploitation. They are the past law workers of our contemporary apartheid system of labor, mobility, labor and mobility control. Maine falls entirely within the so-called constitution-free zone, that area 100 miles inland from any US border within which normal laws can be suspended in the interest of national security. Border patrol agents, whose numbers in Maine have grown from 20 in 2001 to 200 today, are allowed to stop and question anyone, anytime, anywhere in Maine about their citizenship. As you all know from the news, they are setting up roadblocks, they're boarding buses to question people. While people are not obligated to answer their questions about citizenship status, if the agents have reason to suspect someone might not be a citizen, they can take that person into custody to investigate them. And such decisions are often made on the basis of assessments about race and assumptions about who should belong and who doesn't. So the local expression of the militarized system of global apartheid that I've been describing is manifesting in Maine in various ways. 
in racialized anti-immigrant discourses and legislative proposals by officials, and the rejection of our participation in the Federal Refugee Resettlement Program, another closing down of a border, and a rise in deportations from Maine, and Maine's dependence on migrant labor, seasonal guest workers, and undocumented workers, and through exp the expanding activities of Customs and Border Patrol and ICE agents throughout Maine. So I'll turn to my conclusions, so we've got time for commentary, questions, conversation. In Maine and throughout the US, we have contradictory yet intertwined historical currents to choose from. On the one hand, we have a history of genocide against indigenous people, a history of white supremacy, a history of denying citizenship to slaves and aboriginal peoples, a history of immigration bans on people from Asian countries, a history of color bars, a history of national origins quotas that discriminated against Jews, and a government willing to vilify racial and religious groups, Asians, Jews, African Americans, as threats to national security. On the other hand, we have the history of those who fought against racist, xenophobic, anti-Semitic, anti-black, discriminatory, genocidal policies of their time. Such groups and individuals continue to fight for fair, non-reactionary immigration policies. Currently, the US, along with other countries in the global north, is claiming to maximize its own self-protection through militarizing its border, using mass incarceration and deportation against immigrants, and pushing migrants into the desert to suffer and die. Governments shape populations by policing who gains entry and by removing those considered undesirables. Removals, I'm arguing, are often racist projects of prejudice and cultural consolidation, nativist cultural consolidation, and they're often hidden within self-serving discourses of nationalism and security. Apartheid in South Africa collapsed because of its unsustainable internal contradictions and its vast expense, and it's, of course, it's, it, it's inherent evil. This is something I think we need to be worth, that we need to be thinking about. Thank you. Thank you.